morning, everybody, and welcome to Connection Church. And if you're viewing online, I also want to welcome you. Um, if this is your first time here, we'd like to welcome you. Um, today's service is going to be designed around you. Um, in just a little bit, we're going to have some songs we're going to sing, and then uh, the children can be excused to the children's church, and then we'll have a word from our pastor. Uh, if you are here for the first time and you would like to allow us to get to know you a little better, could you just raise your hand? And just keep your hand raised up, and we have an usher that's going to bring you a red bag. Um, inside that red bag, there is a connection card. If you will fill that card out and return it to the hub that's back there in the lobby at the end of service, we'll have a gift for you. Um, and if you're viewing with us online, um, we'd also like to connect with you if you are viewing for the first time. If you could just go to our website, which is cc4square.org and click on menu, go down to online visitor, and fill out that form, um, we'd also like to get you a gift in the mail. We have a few uh, announcements this morning. Um, we still need people for um, volunteering for the hub. Uh, you can sign up at the hub, which is that little square um, podium back there in the lobby. Um, we also have a, a parenting workshop that's gonna be on Friday the 14th. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet also back there for that. And May 28th is a Friday. We have a spaghetti feed um, for the youth. And you can, uh, I think you can buy tickets for that uh, back there also. So now we're just going to take a few minutes to stand up and meet somebody new. So. All right. Glad to see you all here. I'm going to start us off with the scripture and then. After that, after I pray, you guys can figure out if you want to stand, if you want to sit, if you want to bow your head, however you want to worship is great. Um, I'm going to read from Matthew 11, starting in verse 28. It says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. And I'm sure, I don't know if all of you know, but there's like, a, I guess it's a story of like, you have an older, mature ox, and then you have like a younger ox, and they yoke them together so that the younger can learn from the older and how they're, you know, how you're supposed to plow those straight lines, how you're supposed to do things. And I picture Jesus in that yoke, that's him, and then that's us next to him, being equally yoked. Does that make sense? And there's some things in our lives, like, we don't know what to do. We don't, maybe we're a little rough around the edges, or maybe um, we're not so meek and so lowly, like he says, to come to me, because I am meek and lowly. So I just encourage you this morning, as you're thinking about going into worship, as you're thinking about your week, maybe the last conversation that you had with somebody, was I meek and was I lowly? And if not, you know, you always get a second chance, right? So um, I just want to encourage you as we're going forward in worship this morning that that you would just um, soften your heart, that you would humble your heart, and just hear what the Lord is saying to you this morning. So Heavenly Father, we just thank you. God, we do want to be obedient and come unto you like you said. We can't do things on our own. We don't have it all under control. God, there's things that you ask us to do and to just humbly come next to you as you show us the way, God, as you guide us each and every step. God, we praise you, God. We thank you, God, that that yoke, God, is an example of your will. It says, take my yoke upon you, and it's our job, Lord God, to figure out what your will is. But God, you're not hiding it from us. You're not, like, keeping it or dangling it in front of us what your will is, God. But you ask us to press in, and then you ask us to um, learn of you because you are weak, you are meek, and you are lowly. And so, God, I just pray that you would help our hearts to just line up with you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing this song in the words. It's King, you can stand if you want. You can sing if you want. However you want. But let the King of my heart, and then. we sing this to him, is he really the king of our hearts? Are we laying everything down at his feet? Can we call him Lord and Savior? Can we call him king? And know that he is good. There's another part of the song that says you are good. And so do we know that?
wants to work in your life. Can I have some elders come up here?
Lord, we praise you. You are so good to us, Jesus. Tori, I'll just get you to kind of keep playing softly. We're going to take the opportunity this morning to start out our month with communion. And um, I'm just really excited to be able to honor Jesus in this fashion, especially, you know, in the sermon series that we're in right now. We've been doing a lot of work in the Old Testament, right? And while the Old Testament absolutely teaches us so much, we still got to remember it's all about Jesus, isn't it? Amen. Yeah, so we are so thankful for Jesus. As I was, um, as I was considering the, the current condition of both of our sanctuaries now, both at this campus and the Anderson campus, currently right now, even in this one, because of remodeling and things like that, both of our sanctuaries are lacking two critical things that are required of a four-square church. And we'll have it fixed soon. That's why I don't mind saying it. But every sanctuary in a four-square church should have Hebrews 13, 8 on the wall, which is Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So we are so grateful to be able to celebrate Jesus. And I just want to say, if you're kind of new with us here and you don't know whether or not you should take communion, I hope the fact that every seat in here had one on it makes you feel welcome to take communion, right? So please take communion with us and do not be afraid to do so. If you have received Christ as your Savior, you are welcome to take communion. When I was a kid, when they would take communion, they would practically scare you to death before it was time to take communion. Like if you had any little bit of sin in your life and you took communion you were taking it in an unworthy fashion and and that's just not what it's saying in first corinthians 11 i'd love to teach on that again sometime but you are welcome to take communion with us today and i think in the past communion has even been a little intimidating to me as a pastor because I felt like if we're doing communion, we should structure the whole service around it. My sermon should be about communion. And, but you know, that's just not the case. Jesus said, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. So we're going to start taking communion on the first Sunday of every month. And um, I'll tell you who was such a great role model for me in that as a pastor, I would, I would say most of you don't know him, but I said that in the first service. And it turned out that everybody knew him and has known him longer than me. So um, there's a pastor, his name is Louis Locke, and he, he's semi-retired now. He pastored over in Carson City, Nevada. And I would go and visit his church sometimes, and he took communion every single Sunday. They did communion. They would stop the service at some point in the worship, take communion every Sunday. And when I would see him doing that, I was thinking, well, you know what? We should be getting a little closer to that as well. So we're going to celebrate what Jesus has done for us today and allowing his body to be broken and his blood to be shed for us. So I want to share with you a scripture. It started with the bread. It says that he took the bread and he gave thanks. Now on each of your seats was the little cup with the wafer. And I would just encourage you right now to start attempting to get that wafer off of the top of your cup. Okay, so, um, you know, when um, for the most part now, when I'm doing sermons, I have the scripture slides up behind me on the screen, and then a lot of people are using their cell phones too to get the scriptures on them and things like that. But back in the day when I was preaching, the only thing you had was an overhead projector, right? The little transparency so you didn't really put your sermons up on that or your scriptures and you had your bible so when you would give people a verse you know that we were going to teach from you would wait until you heard the pages stop turning right so you'd stand there it's like oh i still hear pages turning so that meant people were still finding it still finding it well communion is kind of like that these days when i hear the cellophane wrappers stop like <laughs> I know we're ready to continue, okay? So um, that being said, as soon as you can, get your wafer ready. And in Luke chapter 22 is where we'll be reading from. It says, and he took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it to them saying, 
this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus, when we think of who you are, Lord, as the one and only begotten Son of God, having no sin, and just the wonder of who you are, God manifested in the flesh. Lord, your nature, just who you are, Jesus, and just even how good you are and how much you've loved us. And, and when we think about that, Lord, and we think that you allowed your body to be beaten and bruised and whipped and nailed to a cross for us, Lord, so that by your stripes we may be healed. Lord, we are in awe of you. We are in awe of you, God. We thank you. We thank you, Lord, for the sacrifice that you made for us. We thank you, Father. I can't imagine what it was like to see your son on that cross, but you loved us so much, God, that you gave, you gave your only begotten son. So we thank you for this. Jesus, I pray, Lord, that you would meet us in this time of remembrance, Lord. That if there are people in here who in any way, Lord, whether it's physically or in their souls, Lord, or in their relationships or whatever, if there is anyone in here who by your stripes needs to be healed, we pray that that would happen today, Jesus. Meet us in this time, Lord, we pray. Amen. Let's receive the bread. It says, in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, this is the cup, or this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. So Jesus, we do thank you for the new covenant. We thank you, Lord, that it's not some temporary fix like the blood of lambs or goats or however they were doing it in the Old Testament. It's not something that's going to fade away or wear off, Jesus. It is permanent. It is forever. We have been washed from our sins, and we have been sealed for eternity by the blood of Jesus Christ. So we thank you for this, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you allowed your sinless blood to be shed on our behalf so that we wouldn't need to do that for our own sins. You did it for us, Lord. It says, Lord, that the chastisement for our peace was on you, Lord. You took it for us. So we thank you, Lord, and we pray, God, that you do help us to live lives worthy of the sacrifice that you've shed for us. We pray, Lord, that we're not ever guilty of it, like in Hebrews 10, Lord, to where we are trampling the blood of Christ underfoot with our sinful lives, Lord. We don't want to be that, Lord. We want to do our best to live for you, to serve you. And really to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to do that. So Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for shedding your blood for us, or shedding your blood for us. And I'm thinking, Lord, of Peter, when you were washing his feet. And he said, well, then not just my feet, but my whole body. And, and you said to him, those who have been washed don't need to have their whole bodies washed again. But Lord, like Peter, we all pick up some stuff as we walk through this world. And there may just be an area of our life that really needs to be touched up right now, Lord. Something that's just crept in there and it's not that we're not saved or that you've turned your back on us or anything else, but we may need that time with you, Lord, that kind of foot washing Jesus. So I pray, Lord, at this time, God, if there's something in our heart that shouldn't be there, that we would turn it over to you, Lord that we would repent of it and just be washed again, Lord, that kind of refreshing that we need, Lord Jesus. Again, Lord, we thank you for your blood that was shed for us. In your mighty name, amen. 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 Let's take the cup. Ah, praise the Lord. All right. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thanks, worship team. Good morning, church. Good morning, Pastor. How are we doing? Amen. God is good. 
God is so good to us. So, a couple of things. One, I should share with you, um, if you're looking for ways to give today, if you need to pay your tithes and your offering and you want to... And you want to honor the Lord, we know that um, God loves cheerful givers, so um, pray that you would be cheerful about it as you give. And if you're not cheerful about it, I pray that you would just give anyways, right? So anyhow, um, if you want to give today, we you can stop by the hub afterwards and we can, um, we can handle that for you back there. If, different ways of doing that online and you are welcome to access any of those. And then um, I came in here kind of last minute. Did we talk about summer camp and spaghetti feeds and all that stuff? Okay, yeah. So we're doing a summer camp this year for our kids. Yeah, we are super excited to be able to do that. Braden, are you going to come do it? Awesome, dude. Okay, so um, yeah, in the past, we've always had district camps available to us at our at our four square district camp, which is called Old Oak Ranch. And those of you who have been to Old Oak Ranch, you know how incredible it is. It is like this 450 acre, you know, just mountain getaway with, you know, lodges and cabins and this big worship center and giant swimming pools and just, you know, it's incredible. And we've been able to do district camps there every single year for our young people and adults. But it was closed, of course, to camps in 2020 because of COVID. And it technically still is closed as far as district camps are concerned. But um, as the Lord would have it, we happen to know the person with the keys, right? So um, about between five and seven or eight churches, some of us have gotten together and we're putting on a camp for our youth at Old Oak Ranch. So we're going to be just doing all the work ourselves. We're going to be cooking. We're going to be, you know, cleaning up. We're going to be doing everything, manning the booths, all that stuff. We're taking extra volunteers up there to help put this camp together. We're, you know, all sharing the load of teaching and worship, and we're just going to do this camp for our kids. And we're super excited about it. So um, even though it's not going to be a district camp, which would typically have between five and 800 kids per camp at it, right? We're still on track to have about 250 kids at this camp. So um, we're excited to be able to do it. So be sure to help support the kids in that. They're doing the spaghetti fundraisers. And then pretty soon you'll see the thing up in the end, you know, when we start announcing these things about if you want to sponsor a kid or if you just want to sponsor half a kid to go to camp or if you want to sponsor a leg, you know, we have it all broke down for you. Like how much of a kid do you want to sponsor to get to camp? So um, we are really excited to be able to do camp for our kids this year. You guys ready to get into the word? Yeah. I hope so, because I'm ready to preach it. <laughs> We're going to be in 1 Samuel again. And um, last Sunday, if you remember, we took the time to contrast the foundational difference between the first two kings in... Um, Israel's history, King Saul and King David. And while they did have amazing differences or drastic differences, they did have a couple of things in common. One is that they had both been selected by God, and the other is that they had both been anointed by God. But in that, they had these tremendous differences as well. And I guess the simplest way of putting it right now, without just re-preaching that whole sermon again, is that Saul is a reflection of what happens when people get the desires of their own heart, right? And King David is an example of what happens when people get the desires of God's heart, right? So Saul's, Saul's um, time as king was literally born out of the people telling God what they wanted. They said, no longer do we want Samuel over us, right? But we want a king like the other nations. How would they know that? 
I don't know, right? It's interesting how they got that into their heads because it's not like they could see what the conditions were in other nations by watching CNN or something at the time. They weren't on social media seeing how people were living in those other nations. They didn't just get off the phone with somebody in a neighboring nation and that person was like, oh, it's so good over here. You got to get a king like we have. Or, you know, they had no access to any of, the, any of those things. And yet they just knew we will be happy if we have a king like the other nations, right? So God went ahead and gave them a king. He informed Samuel, Samuel, it's not you that they've rejected. They've actually rejected me in this. And God gave them a king like the other nations. And we talked about that, how in a way we sort of do that too when we fall into the habit of, or the, the mistake even, let alone a habit, but even a mistake of telling God what will make us happy. And really, how do we know? How do we know? We don't know we'd be happier in another job. We think we would be. We don't know we'd be happier in another relationship. You think you would be, but you don't know that, right? Most of the time, it doesn't work out that way. You don't know you'd be happier in another home or, you know, but we just get into this habit of telling the Lord, oh, if I just had this, this would make me happy. I need this, right? And what's scary is sometimes God goes ahead and grants it to us. And once that happens a few times, once you get your own way over God's way a few times, you'll learn to not want that, right? We want God's heart for us. It's interesting when you look at David then, who is this reflection then of what happens when we desire God's heart, right? What happens to that? Look at what is reflected in his writings then. Like in Psalms chapter 37, David offers this piece of counsel to, him, to us. He says, delight yourself also in the Lord. Listen to this. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Now, what does he mean by that? Does he mean if you delight yourself in the Lord, that God is going to give you everything that you desire in your heart? Or does he mean delight yourself in the Lord and God will give you the desires to have in your heart? Which is meant by that? I think there's a little bit of both in that. And that when we're delighting ourselves in the Lord and coming to that um, alignment with him, that God not only places desires in us, but then he actually fulfills those desires for us. I think it's very similar to what Jesus was saying when he said, if you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. Well, that doesn't mean, if you've ever tried it, believe me, it doesn't work, you know this doesn't work, that you, that you can just think of anything, ask for it, clamp in Jesus' name on it, and you get it, right? That's not how it works. So we know that there's something about being in alignment with the name of Jesus and being grafted into the vine and abiding in Jesus, that when we are in abiding in him and in his word and walking according to his will, when we ask something as residents within his name, he'll do it. That's what he means, not just saying in the name of Jesus. Honestly, that is akin to taking Jesus' name in vain. It's really asking something while residing in the person of Jesus. Then he's going to do it. This Psalm 37 that David gives us here, he says, Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. The key word for me is the first one, which is delight. Delight yourself in the Lord. I looked it up in the Hebrew to see what the actual definition of that word is. And I bet it's a lot different than you think it would be. The word delight there in the Hebrew literally means to be soft and pliable. Like that's, you know how they give multiple definitions of a word. That's not even like the third or fourth one down. Or That is the primary definition of the word in the Strong's Concordance is to be soft and pliable. 
And what it means is if you remain malleable, are you familiar with that word? If you can be shaped. In the first service, I said shapeable, right? And then I looked at Pastor Jack and I said, is that a word? And he said, sure, why not? Which was not like tremendously assuring, right? But if you remain malleable, if you can be somebody whose heart is shaped by God, then he will give you the desires of your heart, right? So just in its context there, it implies we have to be the type of people who can be influenced and shaped by God, that our desires need to be adjustable to what God's are, right? We have to be soft and pliable. So last week, um, we looked at the selection and the anointing of these two kings. And we went ahead and drew a distinction between them, between two English words that I'm not sure there is a distinction between them. But for the sake of preaching, I just made up one, right? So I said, Saul was a king who was selected by God. David was a king who was chosen by God. But if you read like those things in the context, Saul was a king who had been selected in response to the desires of their heart. And David was a king who was selected because of the desires of his own heart. Does that make sense? So yes, God selected Saul and he gave the people what they wanted and he even gave Saul a fair shake. It wasn't just like, okay, here he is. He looks just like the other kings from the other nations. He's big and strong, right? But I'm done with it and turned it back. No, he anointed Saul. He gifted Saul. But it was still a response to the cry of their own heart, right? It wasn't the desire of God's heart. So we looked at the selection of those kings and the fruit of getting our own way. And really, the, the better thing than getting our own way was like we looked at last week, to be content with who God is and what he has made you to be and what he has for you. Now, in addition to that, last week we looked at selection and anointing. Today, I want to look at how these two people were actually introduced to us in the story. Like, what do we find them doing when we first meet them? How are... What are the circumstances surrounding um, our introduction to King Saul and our introduction to King David? Are you with me so far? Amen. Does that sound wildly interesting to you? Is it the most fascinating thing you've ever thought of in your life? All right, then I'll continue. Thank you for those unsolicited positive words. So um, the introduction around King Saul, in 1 Samuel chapter 9, it says, There was a Benjamite, a man of standing, whose name was Kish. I'm laughing because I'm about to venture into some wild names to read, right? <laughs> the son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Bacharath, the son of Aphiah, of Benjamin, Kish had a son named Saul, as handsome a young man as could be found anywhere in Israel. And he was a head taller than anyone else. Now the donkeys belonging to Saul's father, Kish, were lost. And Kish said to his son, take one of the servants with you and go and look for the donkeys. So he passed through the hill country of Ephraim, and through the area around Shalisha, but they did not find them. They couldn't find these donkeys, right? Ultimately, they never did find them. The donkeys just kind of came home on their own, okay? But it says that they did not find them, so they went to, to the district of Shalem, but the donkeys were not there. Then he passed through the territory of Benjamin, but they did not find them. And when they reached the district of Zuf, Saul said to the servant who was with him, come, let's go back, or my father will stop thinking about the donkeys and start worrying about us, 
right? It's like, it's been so long now, we're not going to find these donkeys. But the servant replied, look, in this town, there is a man of God, and he is highly respected. And he's talking about Samuel, okay? And everything he says comes true. Let's go there now, and perhaps he will tell us what way to take. It's interesting that seeking out God's help in this wasn't even Saul's idea. He was just going to give up on the whole thing. He's like, ah, if I need to get home soon, dad's going to start worrying about us. And it was the servant who said, let's inquire of the man of God and see if God can help us in this. It was not Saul's idea. Now, David, on the other hand, has a different um, sort of introduction. Samuel is sent to the house of Jesse because he knows that one of Jesse's sons is going to be anointed as king, right? So he goes before Jesse and Jesse starts, you know, bringing out son after son to see which one is going to be king. So the first thing, one that comes out is Eliab. And it says, when they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab, and he thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands before me, right? Now, what we know then is Eliab must have been some kind of big, strong, good-looking guy, right? Somebody who, likes Saul, would be a person who you would look at him and go like, this guy's got to be the one, right? But listen to the Lord's response to Samuel. He says, do not consider his appearance or his height, don't consider those things. He says, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. Can we all say amen to that? God does not look at the same things people look at. People look at all kinds of different things and think, oh, this is it. Oh, this is the one. Oh, this is the way. This has to be the way. And God just does not see it that way. I'm glad God looked at me at some point and didn't see me the way everyone else did. All of us should be happy about that, Amen. right? God looks at you and he says, I see what I can anoint that person to be. Doesn't matter if a thousand other people passed over you. Doesn't matter if somebody saw your, you know, whatever your proverbial brother is right next to you and thought, oh, that must be the one. And God's like, nope, this is the one. This is the one I want. This is the one I've accepted. So he goes on to say, people look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called the rest of them, Abinadab, and, and he wasn't the one, and so on. And finally, in verse 10, it says, Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are these all of your sons? And he says, well, there still is the youngest, right? But he is tending the sheep. What a contrast. You're introduced to Saul, and he's lost the donkeys, right? He's looking all over for his father's donkeys. He never does find the donkeys, he gives up on finding the donkeys. The donkeys just end up making their own way home, right? And finally, he goes home. And that's, that's kind of the imagery of Saul that we have as an introduction. Somebody just losing his dad's donkeys. But then you've got this introduction to David, and here he is tending his father's sheep. And not just tending them, but doing it well doing it well, tells us that one time a bear attacked the flock and David killed the bear. It is not easy to kill a bear. It's very hard to kill a bear. I grew up in a family of hunters. My dad was a hunting machine, right? Wild pigs, deer, bear, everything. He was constantly hunting. All the guys in our church hunted right? So not only did they have all their own stories, but they had a million other stories about, about hunting. And I'll never forget, I, they told me this story one time. I think it was true. If not, you know, never let the truth get in the way of a good story. I've told you that. 
But they told me about this guy who was cornered by a grizzly bear. And he pulled out his 357 Magnum and he shot the bear in the head twice and it kept coming at him, oh, right? And finally he shot it in the body and got it to drop. But when they skinned the bear, they found that the bullets had hit its skull, flattened out, and just slid around under the skin. Wow. Like it wasn't even penetrating, right? That's a bear. And David killed one. <laughs> With what, a sling? You know what I mean? It's like he took one down because it attacked the sheep. It says one time a lion attacked the sheep, and he snatches it up by the beard, right, and kills it. A lion this guy who obviously must not have been huge in stature because he wasn't the one by implication we know. He wasn't the one that you would look at and go like, oh, this guy has to be a king. Look at the size of him, right? He wasn't that guy, and yet he was, he was that type of shepherd. What a contrast between him and Saul. One can't even keep track of his dad's donkeys, never did find them, right? And then one is accurately tending the sheep. So for this week, we're going to draw the contrast between a shepherd king and a donkey king, right? Because Saul was a donkey king. In a way, donkeys kind of represent what sort of king he was. Stubborn, <laughs> didn't listen, right? Running off, doing his own thing, not able to be led, impatient, came back when he felt like, not when he was supposed to, right? It's perfectly an analogy for Saul. He was a total donkey king. And just praise the Lord that I'm not using the King James version of it. <laughs> we'll just leave it at donkey king, right? Just stubborn in his own will wanting his own way. And yet David is a shepherd king. And in a way, those sheep reflect his heart as well. Because not only was he a shepherd, a good shepherd, but he was somebody who enjoyed being shepherded. You know, I'll share this with you, and I hope that you understand that there is, there is not a hint of pride behind this when I say this to you. But everywhere I've ever ended up in life, and it's not because of anything, believe me, it's not because of merit, it's certainly not because of education. I don't know what it is, right? Well, actually I do and I'll tell you. Anywhere I've ended up in life, I've ended up in leadership. Whether it was the church, whether it was the workplace, whatever, I've always ended up in a place of leadership. And believe me, I don't seek it out. In fact, at our AM service this morning, we had Pastor Jack there. And I said, this was his fault, right? It's like I was perfectly happy serving him and being an associate pastor to him. And I loved that role. Even when I was a machinist, I loved and longed for the days when I would just get a stack of prints and stand at my own machine and just work like an animal all day long, right? And whatever they gave me to do, you know, designing it, whatever, it's like, yes, I'm going to do that and I'm going to do it better than anyone else has ever done it, right? That was my mindset when I would go into those things. I loved it. I loved it. But what I found is when you know how to be under authority, you find yourself in authority. And we see that with David here. He knew how to be under authority. And as a result of it, he always appreciated or he always ended up being in authority. So when we see him as a shepherd, it reflects him in more ways than one. You got the donkey king, the stubborn guy, right, who can't be led or anything else. But David not only was a shepherd, he enjoyed being shepherded. It shows up in his writings. 
Think about the most famous, probably, of his writings in Psalms chapter 23. How does it start out? The Lord is my shepherd. Right? You never find Saul saying anything like that. You never find a place where Saul confesses, the Lord is my shepherd. Right? Like, David really just saw himself as an under-shepherd to the good shepherd. The Lord. He said, the Lord is my shepherd. I'm going to go ahead and read it to you. He said, I shall not want. Listen to his concept of being shepherded by God. It says, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He leads me. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever I love how he states that he makes me to lie down see David was desirous of God's desires not the desires of his own fleshly heart donkey king shepherd king so what do you get with a donkey king mentality There's this story where, and hopefully I get this all right, because I'm kind of doing this off the top of my head, other than the verse I have in front of me, but where there was a siege, and I'm sure if I get this wrong, Diana could help me with it, because she actually has written an amazing book on all of this, but um, there was a siege against a city in Israel from the Amalekites. And it's the one, I believe it's the time where they were going to come in and kill everyone, but they gave them the opportunity to surrender. But the surrender had on it some kind of crazy like stipulations, like we will allow you to surrender, you Israelites, but we're going to poke out one of your eyeballs and chop something off, like chop your toes off or something like that. I mean, it was really rough. So these people are in a horrible predicament. It's like, well, if we stand and fight, we're going to lose and just be decimated. If we surrender, we're going to be disfigured, right? So they're crying out in despair, and God gives this response. It says, Samuel said to Saul, right, I am the Lord sent to anoint you king over his people. So listen now to the message from the Lord. This is God's message to Saul in response to this. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they waylaid them as they came up out of Egypt. Now go and attack the Amalekites and totally destroy all that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death the men, the women, the children, the infants, the cattle, the sheep, the camels, and the donkeys. And I know that sounds harsh. I've taught on that before. I'm not going to do that again today. That was the command of the Lord to Saul. Here's how I want you to deal with the Amalekites. Utterly eradicate them. Saul did not do this. He had mercy on them. He spared all the livestock. The king, he didn't put the king to death, Agag. He ended up just chopping off his thumbs and his big toes. And it's like, well, why on earth would you do that? That was a custom they would do back then because they couldn't run anymore and they couldn't hold a sword, right? So it was like this guarantee that this king will never rise up against me again. But he had mercy on him and didn't put him to death. And eventually Samuel showed up and rectified the situation and handled it himself. But fast forward now to a different time when now David is well known to Saul. In fact, David is Saul's son-in-law at this point. David has fought victories. David has slain Goliath. David has done all these things. And Saul has been overwhelmed 
in this jealous, depressed rage about David. And now he's trying to kill David all the time, right? And David is on the run. And David ends up in this village. Which village was it? It was the, the village of Nob, okay? And he goes to the priest there, Ahimelech. And David says, my men are starving, right? And this is the time where the priest gives David and his men the showbread to eat, okay? And then David goes on from there. Saul gets word of the help that David received in this city, and he goes to them for doing that, and now he's about to execute judgment on them for helping David. It says, Then the king ordered Doeg, You turn and strike down the priest. So Doeg the Edomite turned and struck them down. That day he killed 85 men who wore the linen ephod. He had 85 of the priests in that city killed. Okay, all of them. And not only that, he put also to the sword Nob, the town of the priest, with its men, with its women, its children, and infants, and its cattle, and its donkeys, and its sheep. It's interesting to me that God said that is how to deal with the Amalekites, who are the enemies of Israel, and Saul had mercy on them. But then on his own people that he was king over, Israel, right? He had no mercy on them and treated them the way he was supposed to treat the Amalekites and utterly eradicated them. And see, what Saul, what he demonstrates for us is when you are walking according to your own desires and not God's desires, you will find yourself loving the things that God hates and hating the things that God loves. Saul perfectly proves it. He was always stubborn, always doing his own thing, always impatient on the Lord. And as a result, not only was he born out of the desires of people's hearts, he walked according to his own heart's desires. And as a result, he found himself, not as a plan. It's not something he intended on doing, like, I want to be a guy with this attitude. No, but he found himself loving what God hated and hating what God loved. This isn't just a, a one-off result in Saul's life. This is all of us. When we are walking according to our own desires, right? We are going to find ourselves embracing the things that God does not want us to embrace. And we're going to find us, ourselves rejecting the things that God wants us to love. It just happens. It happens when you walk to, according to your own desires, you're not going to be finding what God loves for you. It happens on a personal level with us. This is the nature of sin. It is the nature of selfishness that it is going to cause us to miss the mark that God has set for us. That's how you define sin, missing the mark. God has a target in mind for our life. He has a plan for our life. He has a plan for our behavior, our existence, what we practice, all of those things. God has a plan for it. And when you miss that mark, the term sin in the New Testament is literally from an archery term. And it means to miss the mark. You missed it. And that's what sin does. It causes you to miss the mark. That's all born out of walking according to our own desires and not God's desires. And you'll find yourself loving the things that God hates or hating the things that God loves. Now, the things that you find yourself loving, if you're outside of God's will, but maybe you're loving something and you're like, this is not a bad thing. How could this be hated by God? I would tell you that biblical hatred is often different in its definition and how we think of hatred. Like Jesus said something to the effect of, I should have written it down here so I could quote it exactly. But he's all, whoever does not come after me and hate his own father and mother and, you know, and he lists all these family members. He said, whoever doesn't come after me and hate all of them is not worthy of me. And it's like, my goodness, that seems awfully rough. God wants me to hate my mom, you know? No, 
obviously not. God doesn't want us to hate anyone in that definition of hatred as we think of it. But what it means is God needs to be preferred above them. God needs to be first before them, even first before your spouse. God needs to be first. What does that mean? If it comes down to a decision between pleasing that person or pleasing God, God is going to be the one being pleased. It's not a hatred in the literal sense of hatred towards that person. It's preferring God first. So often these things that end up in our life as a result of our own desires, they don't necessarily seem like things that are hateable. But they're our desires and not God's desires. And God's desires need to be first for us. So it happens on a personal level. It happens on a national level. You can see right now, there is this desire in our nation for people to be able to define everything about themselves. Everything they want to be is whatever they desire it to be. Paul told us about populations like this. He said in Romans chapter one, he said, when people reject God as creator, when they worship the creature rather than the creator is how he puts it. What does he mean by that? It means I can look at creation and say, this made me, or I can look at creation and say, wow, that declares that God made all of us, right? But when they look at the creature and they worship the creature rather than the creator, it says that there will be a fruit that comes from that. There will be an evidence. And it literally is as simple as this. He said, women will become lovers of other women and men will become lovers of other men. That's the result of it. That's what the Bible says. And we see now in our culture this rampant desire to be able to define people's, not just their own sexuality, but their own gender, right? Like in this crazy level. And for the people who aren't desiring to, to define that for themselves, there is another group of people who ardently want to defend their right to define that for themselves, and it literally is born out of the same thing that happened with Israel when they said, Samuel, we don't want you anymore. And God said, Samuel, they haven't rejected you. They've rejected me. And as a result, they begin to walk according to their own desires. We're living in a time right now where people have rejected God. They've rejected him. And now it's more and more their own desires. And they need to be able to define everything about themselves. This is the situation that we find ourselves in as a nation right now. I've mentioned it to you. In a post-Christian society, there are, there are consequences of that. There is a fruit that comes from that. And it's not about being a hater or anything else. That 100% is. In fact, I'll talk about that in a minute. But it is showing that we are living in a time right now where people are walking according to the desires of their own hearts. They want to define everything for themselves. You look at the situation that surrounded the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 12. What is the biggest offense in the Tower of Babel? It's not that the people wanted to build a tall building, right? It's they said, so we can make a name for ourselves, right? And this is the time we're living in. People want to define everything about themselves. It's not that way. God has a design and a purpose for us. So sin, even sins of homosexuality, right? It's not that... That's just a sin that's necessarily worse than all the other sins. It's missing the mark of God's design. It's saying, I know what's better for me, God. I know what's going to make me happy. I know what's going to fulfill me. And you don't. None of us do. They don't who are engaging in that lifestyle. They don't know that, right? So it affects all of us in some way or another when we start to walk according to that. On a personal level, we see it affecting our nation right now. 
And then, like I said last week, before we get too high and mighty about all of this, we need to get off our, our high horses and see how it's even affecting the church. Some of you last week enjoyed it way too much when you turned to somebody by you and said, get off your high horse, right? I heard so many stories about that afterwards. One husband looked at his wife and he didn't say, get off your high horse. He said, get off your Empire State Building. <laughs> I'm like, what does that even mean? It's like he couldn't even find a big enough analogy in the animal kingdom, right? It's not like he went from a horse to a camel or like a horse to a giraffe, like get off your giraffe. No, it's like, no, animal kingdom won't cover this. I'm going to like one of the tallest buildings in the world. Get off the Empire State Building, right? So I think that um, there was a little too much fun had in that last week and probably a little too much conflict about it afterwards. But um, the church right now, we're off in our desires too. And I'll tell you how, and we'll be done after this. I don't know what time it is, and praise the Lord, I don't. Um, we're off a little bit in our desires because when we look at the world and we look at these parts of, say, the LBGTQ community and we say, oh, that's off, you know, what is our heart about that as we're doing it? Because the first thing we need to remember is that God loves them. And not just people in that particular sin, right? But God loves the lost, period. God loves them. We just celebrated it this morning in communion. Amen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I don't know that the church's overall stance, and I mean the church as the body of Christ, is doing a good enough job right now reflecting that to the world. And I think it's because we have a desire right now that is out of alignment with God's desire. And that desire that I find prevalent right now in the body of Christ is to get back to the way things were. That's our desire as Christians. That seems to be our desire as Americans right now. You'd be like, 30 years ago, it wasn't this way. 20 years ago, you would have never seen this. 10 years ago, they would have never made a decision like that, right? And we're constantly looking back at what was, and we desire what was. And because we're desiring that so strongly, it's keeping us from loving the people who are lost right now. Amen. Because I find that we, the church, are constantly pointing at everybody saying, you're screwing it up. <laughs> you're messing up the country right now. You're doing this, right? Because we're, we're losing something. We see something changing, right? And we have this strong desire for what was. But I think of what Jesus said to us. He said, whoever saves their life, whoever would save their life will lose it. For my sake. And whoever seeks to save their own life, right, will end up losing it as a result. So whoever is willing to lose their life for my sake will save it. Whoever will save their own life is going to end up losing it. Now, what strikes me about that, when Jesus says that in Luke chapter 17, and this is where I think the realignment has to happen for the church, when Jesus gives us that passage, he draws for us the perfect analogy. He said, it's really just like Lot's wife. Now, what happened with Lot's wife? If you remember, the angels came and brought them out of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah before God would destroy them with sulfur and brimstone and all of that, right? And as they're walking away, she turns around and looks back at Sodom and Gomorrah, the judgment that's happening, and she turns into a pillar of salt, right? She was warned, don't look back, right? But she looked back, she turns to a pillar of salt. 
Jesus uses that as the analogy for whoever will lose their life will save it, but whoever would save their own life is going to end up losing it. The sin of Lot's wife wasn't just like turning around to see the big fireworks show. The sin was what was taking place in her heart and that she was mourning having lost her own life. She lost her lifestyle. She was losing her home. She was losing that culture. She was losing everything about it. And rather than seeking what was in front of her, what God had in store for her, she was too busy turning around, thinking about what she had lost. And that's what Jesus is saying. If you're turning around trying to save your own life all the time, you're just going to end up losing it. But if you're willing to lose it and leave it behind, and get your eyes on what's in front of you, you're going to save it. Amen. Now, as I said, if we're going to walk according to our own desires, and our desire is to just get back to the 80s, right? Which if you actually lived through the 80s, it's not as great as people think it was, right? <laughs> yes, we love Ronald Reagan. No, we don't love mullets. Although they seem to be coming back. And I had a sweet one. We don't love parachute pants, right? But if all we're desiring is to get back to the way things were, if that's our own desire, in the same way, we're going to find ourselves loving the things that God does not care about right now. And we're going to find ourselves against the things that God loves. And what we know God loves for sure is the lost. Our heart needs to change right now from looking backwards to the past all the time to what God wants and the lost that is in front of us. Does that make sense? Amen. Looking backwards is not going to change anything anyways. You're just going to lose it all. If, if all you're trying to do is save that old life, you're just going to lose it all anyways, right? But if you're willing to lose it, just lose it for Jesus' sake, right? Lose it. Let it go. What is in front of us? It's like I said, anytime you have a Saul, anytime you have a donkey king, right? There's always a David on the way. There's something in front of us. God has something good in front of us. We got to let this go and embrace what God has for us. There is some kind of revival coming. There is something coming. Yeah. I know God is too good to not do it. It's coming, but we got to be willing, right? Lose the old life. Get our eyes on what Jesus has. If we don't get in alignment, if we don't get that soft and pliableness, Lord, see, it's, it's when you first hear it, it's like, yes, I'm soft and pliable before the Lord. Really? Are you soft and pliable right now about all the news you're hearing? Are you soft and pliable about, right? Because I'm not always. If you are, you're doing better than me most of the time, right? We got to get soft and pliable about what God's heart is right now, right now. And get our eyes off of trying to save the past. And Lord, what are you doing now? What are you doing now? What is the change now? We know that God is not willing that any should perish. <laughs> How does that look like for us right now? Even in our, our new name as a church, connecting with God, connecting with people, right? Connection Church. But remember the mission behind that so that we can be equipped to go out and connect with people who have no connection with God. It's not our mission to just huddle in little Christian camps, right? No, we want to be out in the world loving people, loving people. That's God's desire. So that takes a little bit of softness of heart for sure. But that's what the Lord desires. It's the difference between having a donkey king attitude and a shepherd king. If not, I got to stop. I was going to make another joke about donkeys, but I better just let it go. I'll find it can include anybody who God has a heart for. 100%.
100%. Father, we thank you that, first of all, Lord, you don't look at people the way that we do. And that's everyone, God. I'm convinced, Lord, that the church is just not seeing people right now the way you do, Lord. There is a, there is a stubbornness, God. There is a grief about what has been lost. There is all these things right now, Lord, but there is not really a saying, God, make your desires my desires. God, give me the desires to have in my heart. So, Lord, I pray that we would be malleable before you. That, Lord, we would stop looking backwards constantly and whatever's been lost. Jesus, you have so much good in front of us. So much good. Who knows what you're going to do, God, but we know we know that something good is on the way. You've told us, don't grow weary in well-doing because we're going to reap a harvest if we don't lose heart and faint. God, we're not going to lose heart. We want what you want. We want to love who you love. We want to reach who you want us to reach. And we thank you for this, Jesus. We thank you for this, Lord. Thank you, God, that we always have hope in you. In your mighty name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you, church. Make sure to... Say hi to someone before you get out of here. And uh, yeah, love you guys. <laughs>